And this week on Quality Digest Live, we take a lean look at risk management with author and trainer Mike McElroy. Plus, NIST and Brunson develop a portable laser tracker calibration artifact. That and more when we come back. This week's sponsor of Quality Digest Live is Olympus, specializing in easy-to-use microimaging and metrology systems that provide the measurement and images you need. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for January 15, 2016. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. And he is, and I'm Quality Digest publisher Mike Richmond. Well, it wasn't so long ago that the only chief in most organizations was the big chief, the big cheese, the top chief dog. executive officer, the top dog, that's right. Uh, and other top executives, of course, held positions of power, but the CEO was the one, well, in theory at least, who was ultimately and directly responsible for all operating functions within the enterprise, right? But over time, more chiefs started popping up to share the load. You had the chief operating officer, the chief financial officer, the chief marketing officer, the chief information officer, the chief party officer. Well, actually, I made that last yeah. one up, but doesn't that sound like a rad job? <laughs> yeah, you I want the to chief be party the officer. chief party officer, dude? <laughs> yeah, we're going to shake it up. Well, anyway, it, it, according to the website uh, Strategy And, which they style Strategy Ampersand, the latest addition to the C-suite is the chief digital officer, the CDO. Well, just 6% of companies worldwide currently have a CDO, but that number is growing rapidly. CDOs are responsible for shepherding their organizations through the, the complex and multifaceted realm of web, web communication and branding. In many cases, that means changing the way these organizations interact, not only with external customers, but with internal processes as well. So is this kind of social media kind of stuff? It, it's, well, it's all media and it's all communications. Okay. It's digital, that's the key, is, okay. is digital. So it's anything that has to do with, with inter, interactive online communications in any format okay. that it may, may take. To do this now, CDOs need to have a transformational mindset and take a cross-functional approach to working to redefine operations and sales and marketing, processes, production, everything. You name it within an organization. Uh, so as you would expect, organizations in the more customer-facing industries, such as ours, ours media and entertainment, food and beverage and consumer goods, they're the ones that are hiring CDOs really at a very rapid pace, and, and many uh, large and sprawling multinationals are, are doing the same thing. And, and that makes sense because their companies really need someone mining those types of initiatives in a, a centralized fashion. You know, somebody that, that's mining the store because, you know, you have a lot of divisions, a big company. Sure. Somebody needs to be de organizing that messaging and making sure that it's strategically aligned with what the company is doing. Oh, and an interesting point about this is that European companies are hiring CDOs fastest mm. of all. And I think that kind of uh, underscores their understanding of the importance of this function, and, and European companies have usually been very good at communications, in generally, in a general fashion. I mean, right. nothing's, nothing's uh, the same all over, but generally speaking, you find European companies are pretty much ahead of the curve in terms of using social media and, and minding the store in a better fashion, maybe than some American companies in this realm. So CDOs, only 6% of companies now have a CDO, but I, you're probably gonna see that number grow a lot in the forthcoming uh, years and decades, I would think. Yeah. Chief Digital Officer. That's right, Chief Party Officer. Uh, yeah, that, I, that's the one I want to go for. <laughs> all right. Well, so for more information on this story, and in fact, all of the pieces that we share with you on today's show, uh -huh. be sure to check out the story links just below the video screen, right down right there. Right down there, check them out. Okay. Um, you know, um, we talk on the show, obviously, we talk about, uh, very often we talk about industrial mm -hmm. measurement equipment, you know, CMMs, you know, and, and force measurement and dimensional measurement mm -hmm. of all type. And usually we think of, uh, because it's the industry we work in, we, we think of it usually in terms of manufacturing sure. processes. So it's kind of interesting when we come across one of these tools that we've used here ourselves in the studio, uh, in Tech Corner, for instance, and see them used in quite a different spot. And we got a, uh, we got a press release um, this week from uh, Mark Tan. We've had Mark Tan's equipment on the show before, they make uh, force measurement equipment. Exactly. This one used for a p police department. So the New York Police Department, uh, in an effort to reduce the incidence of accidental gun discharge by their officers, um, has been modifying the standard for its off-the-shelf firearms to require a greater amount of force to pull the trigger. Uh, 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 according to a 2008 Rand Center for Qu Quality Policing report, 
NYPD has increased the trigger pressure required for a Glock to discharge from about five and a half pounds to 12 pounds. They've increased the force required to pull the trigger by about twice. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea behind there is, is that's quite a bit of force and it would be unlikely even if you were you were nervous or in the heat of, of, of an arrest or something like that to to accidentally apply that much force to the mm -hmm. triggers. That was the reason for it, for doubling it. But another thing that they've been doing, and they've been doing all along, is anytime there's an, an officer involved shooting, an officer's weapon is immediately sent to the NYPD firearms laboratory for a whole battery of tests. And among those tests is something called a trigger pull force test. Um, obviously what they're looking for is to see, well, does this gun have a hair trigger? Right. If the officer said my gun was accidentally fired, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So traditionally this was done by hanging a known weight from uh, a gun trigger. And, and the, the way to think about this is uh, you, you have your gun in the lab, uh, here's the trigger, here's the barrel. They aim the gun up, they hang a known weight from it. Let, let's say the pull force is supposed to be 12 pounds. So maybe they hang a weight uh, of about maybe 11 and a half pounds, something right. a little under. And they hang the weight. If the trigger triggers, that means that the pull force was too small. Underweight. Underweight. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't pull the trigger, well, it means it was more than that, so that's a good thing. So mm -hmm. basically, it's a go, no-go test. It's either the weight pulls the trigger or it doesn't, and, but it's not very accurate, if you can imagine about it. I mean, if you think about, um, if you think about your, your back to your physics and trigonometry days, um, you know that uh, you have your, your vector force. So if your gun is kind of at an angle, well, the force pulling down on it is different than if the gun is straight up. You're, you're trigger is also curved, mm -hmm. so if the, if the thing that's pulling the trigger, the string or whatever they use, is on a different part of the curve, right. that's going to supply a different force. So all sorts of variation between lab personnel, and they wanted to get away from that. So Mark 10 was called in to develop a custom solution for the problem, and it's pretty clever. The company's engineers work closely with the NYPD to design a, uh, a customized firearm test stand just for that type of evaluation. Uh, I think we have a picture of it here. Uh, basically, if you look at the picture, uh, if you look on the right-hand side, it's a little hard to see, but there's a little height gauge there. That height gauge allows uh, a little jig that goes into the muzzle of the gun to hold the gun at a predetermined height. Now, this would be different for different models of guns. So a Glock might be one thing, another, uh, another uh, model of, um, of gun might be uh, a different height, but the idea is to hold the muzzle at a predetermined height. On the left-hand side, it's a little hard to see, there's a little white box, and that's the Mark 10 force gauge. That's connected to the trigger by another jig, and you'll see there's a crank there on the left-hand side, and the idea is you keep cranking, you keep cranking on that, it starts pulling the trigger back until the trigger trips, and uh, the Mark 10 force gauge detects that trip and gives them an exact readout of what the trigger uh, pull force was for that gun in that particular setup. And because this is a jig, it's extremely repeatable and kind of takes the whole variance between lab personnel out of the whole, uh, out of the whole equation. So I thought that was a, it's kind of a customized solution that they built uh, directly for uh, the NYPD. It's not something that you can go onto the Mark 10 website and say, hey, I want to order this. Yeah. But it is, it is indicative of how sometimes this equipment we get so used to using in, in industrial settings mm -hmm. gets kind of repurposed and used in really interesting settings in, in something as strange as, as a crime lab. Yeah, but, but important because, I, as you say, it's very important to know in these instances exactly what that pressure is. Right. Because, you know, if it is under, underweight or if it's overweight, I mean, you need to know that. You need to know what, what percentage is under or overweight. And, and, and accidental trigger, and accidental firing by police officers is an issue. Matter of fact, there's a whole yes. uh, uh, report. I, I mentioned the 2008 RAND Center for Quality Policing Reports, 142-page report, but it basically deals with just that whole issue of gun safety and among other things, uh, accidental discharge yeah. of a gun. Yeah. Uh, we had an incident actually not here, far from here, not, yeah. not, far from here, not too long ago yeah. whether an officer uh, allegedly accidentally shot a, a, su a, a suspect. That's there. right, right, an yeah. accidental discharge and they did a battery test. I'm sure uh, I'm sure a trigger was part of force was one of them. I'm yeah. sure it was pr primary, but a, I, I'm certain because this was an NYPD uh, uh, tool they use, I'm sure they didn't use this tool, but it yeah. would have been a good tool to have used. Oh yeah, yeah exactly. As opposed to the, the, the system. 
system you, you talked about. Yep. That's great, well thanks, Dirk. Okay, well, in Wednesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily, we ran an article from Mike Mickelwright titled Lean Quality and Risk-Based Thinking in ISO 9001 2015. Now, much of the content in this article is taken from Mike's two-part risk management training video set, which is available now. In fact, it, it's officially released just today. Uh, it's on demand for your viewing pleasure online at www. Dot 360performancecircle.com and 360 Performance Circle, as many of you know, is Quality Digest's training division. And we have lots of great content on there, including Mike's entire lean video training series, numbering about 20 episodes so far. And there's more to come later this that year. That guy talks a lot. He does, so, so do we, that's okay. <laughs> well, in this article, Mike addresses ways that those who are first looking at risk-based thinking as a part of ISO 9001 2015 can begin to understand these concepts and apply them for the good of their organizations. The piece explains mistake proofing, the proper way to complete a failure mode and effects analysis, and Hoshin Connery or strategic policy deployment. So, to chat further with us about lean risk and ISO 9001, we're happy to welcome Mike Mickelwright back to the show. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, good to see you guys. Thank you, you're looking good. Thank you for being here from Chicago. Well, Mike, you are a lean trainer, uh, but ISO 9001 usually falls under the realm of quality and, and risk, as we're talking about it here, falls really under ISO 9001. So the question is, what can lean tell us about risk that the other disciplines really can't? I thought I'd put a pause in there since I talk so much. <laughs> Thank you, nice. I appreciate that. That was, that was nice of you. Right. Uh, so I, I know I had you guys worried there for a second. Um, no. And, uh, the, um, yeah, so, so uh, what does lean have to do with risk? Well, you know, lean is, um, as, as so many of us know, it, it's, it's so focused on developing the right culture, right? And it's not tools based, but it's very culture based um, with a lot of tools, uh, or it should be at least. And uh, as such, you know, we develop this Kaizen culture, this continuous improvement culture. That's our focus. That's what we need to do. And we do that by the involvement, getting everyone involved in the organization. Uh, that's a key principle is everyone's involvement in trying to reduce problems and prevent problems and mitigate risks and the whole bit. And so many studies have shown that, that uh, the more you involve people, uh, the more motivated they are. And of course, the more motivated people are, uh, the less the absenteeism is, uh, the less likelihood of a strike occurring. Um, there's uh, more motivation to, uh, to make improvements and people stay at the job a far longer period of time. That being said, that reduces the risks of the organization. Uh, they're more predictable. They know what they can produce. Uh, they're not surprised by events because everyone is happy and involved and pleasantly involved and so uh, lean uh, developing a lean culture reduces the uh, company-wide risk that so many organizations face uh, so that being said the other focus of course is the constant reduction of waste and when we reduce waste we really are reducing the likelihood of risks occurring uh, we're mitigating those risks uh, so it, whether it's, it's waste such as uh, excessive inventory um, or overproduction, uh, when, when we have that, when we have excessive inventory, what does it lead to? Well, it leads to uh, less flexibility, uh, obsolescence of goods. And when we have less flexibility and obsolescence of goods, that makes our delivery times and our lead times much less predictable to our customers, thus increasing the risks of not pleasing our customers, not satisfying them. So risk, uh, everything that we do in lean, and, and granted, like you said, quality seems to be associated with risk and risk management, uh, but, but everything that we do in lean uh, is definitely mitigating risk throughout the entire organization at the highest levels and at the detail levels within the organization. Mike, in, in the series, uh, and I, I think we actually have a clip because I want to kind of show a little bit of this, uh, the quality of this. In the series, you, you do a really nice job, I think, of showing, and people can see it there, showing it in a clear and a graphically engaging way exactly how a user should approach filling out an FMEA, and there's the form right there. So what's the result of that process in a general sense? In other words, I mean, from your perspective, what does an FMEA, filling out an FMEA, that process do for an organization? Well. It's interesting, isn't it? Because FMEA has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, even before we, the term uh, lean was coined, uh, FMEAs existed, and uh, they were introduced uh, back in the aerospace industries back in the 60s. So they've been around for a long time. 
many industries, automotive, aerospace, uh, uh, food equipment, et cetera, a pharmaceutical, have required FMEAs to be done. And now uh, we're going to start to see a, um, a l let's say, a reemergence re of, of FMEA in, in the tool itself. And hopefully it will be deployed much more effectively than it has been in the past. Uh, uh, some organizations just haven't d done a good job at deploying FMEAs and gaining the true benefits. But of course, uh, so now with the new standard, uh, ISO 9001 2015, and the increased emphasis on risk and, and risk management, uh, sometimes these tools like FMEA um, are going to be very, very helpful. And in FMEA, of course, we're identifying the failure modes and the effects on the customers of those failure modes. And then we determine causes and we develop a ranking system and we have a rating system so that we can prioritize uh, where our focus should be, where we take actions. And we do that because we're looking at within a product or within a process, we're looking at what are those risks, what are the effects of the customer, uh, to the customer, and how can we mitigate those. And so the FMEA tool is just a tool that can help mitigate so many of our risks at the detail level, at the process design, the product design level. Um, and, and, and because that focus now it, from ISO 9001 2015 has centered on risk management, this is a tool that can help us to systematically mitigate those risks. Now, the only, pro the only thing about uh, uh, FMEA in the past is that, again, the focus has been just as a tool, and that's how so many organizations have used it, just as a tool. But the requirements in the new standard, ISO 9001-2015, is not talking about the use of tools, but it's talking about a risk management system to systematically reduce risks throughout. So we need an, an ongoing system. That, that FMEA has to be a living document, and when new problems arise or new potential failures arise or are, are identified, uh, then we need to uh, reevaluate and refocus our attentions. Now, a lot of the actions that can come out of an FMEA can be the Kaizen events themselves. Uh, and, and so that you have that relationship, that very strong relationship between um, uh, risk management, uh, the FMEA, and then uh, the Kaizen events, or even the s smaller Kaizen activities, such as doing poke yoke. And Mike, let, Mike let, 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 let's take a look at risk uh, from uh, perhaps a higher level. I mean, you, you've talked about a concept that's probably unknown to a lot of people, uh, Hoshin Conry. Um, what does Hoshin Conry process teach the practitioner about uh, proper planning and execution? Well, Hoshin Conry is a strategic policy deployment, and yes, you're right, uh, to many people maybe that's an unfamiliar term. Um, but in, in a way, the concepts are not really unfamiliar because uh, ISO 9001 and in different parts of the standards uh, have required the elements of what we do in, in, in Hoshin Conry. Um, now, what's important about this is that, well, let, let me give you an alternative uh, uh, situation. Uh, so many times as a, as a consultant, um, we're asked to uh, come in and, and, and uh, partake or, or facilitate an event, whether it's value stream mapping or, or 5S or whatever it might be. Because someone within the organization heard about this fabulous tool and what it can do for the organization and the whole bit. And, and so oftentimes, those are solutions, uh, or they're leading to solutions. Like 5S is really kind of a solution to a problem. Uh, but we don't identify the problem. We don't, uh, we don't know what the problem is. We just go ahead and blindly do 5S, or total productive maintenance, or whatever it might be. And that's not the right way to look at things. Uh, what we really need to do is to look at, well, what's important to the organization as a whole? Uh, what is, is the overall mission? What are the principles uh, of the organization? And then develop the three to five key strategic objectives. Now, some of those objectives might be the mitigation of risks. Um, so we identify those objectives, uh, uh, strategies, I, I should say. We identify those strategies at the very highest level. We deploy those throughout the organization. We deploy those in such a way where we look at strategies, the key strategies, tie them into objectives, tie those into our goals. And each, each level that we go down, we're going down into the depths of the organization. And then when we hit our goals, we have specific goals that we need to achieve. And how are we going to achieve those? Well, then maybe, yes, we achieve that through a 5S event, or we achieve that through a value stream mapping. 
But the point is, is that we want to link the tools um, uh, of lean uh, back to the strategies of the organization itself. Um, so that when we choose to do Kaizen events, when we choose to do lean activities and develop that culture, we are gaining our true benefits to the organization and we're not just haphazardly doing lean. Because we're, we're running a little late, but uh, but that, that's, that's well said and I think that we all should appreciate that. And I think everyone who's interested in this topic, which is should be most of us, uh, should check out the video series. Uh, again, look at uh, www.360performancecircle.com. You can also link out to episodes 29 and 30 in the series, uh, which are just rolling off the assembly line just out now uh, in Mike's article, which is below the video player screen right down there. So Mike, thanks again for joining us and we'll, we'll see you down the road. Thank you, guys. <laughs> talk, See you, Mike. talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Bye. Well, Derek, it was interesting. I know. I know what you're going to say. You're going to you're going to introduce CMSC Corner, but but while we're while as we're getting that queued up, okay. I know that there was an interesting story. Uh, make, make quickly, you can just download it for us between NIST and Brunson with with uh, with oh, calibration of, of uh, yeah. Just just tracking. really yeah. briefly, uh, if you're familiar with laser trackers at all, uh, one of the big issues with laser trackers laser trackers was being able to do a, a, a verification of a laser tracker right. out in the field because these things can measure really large devices and to have a really large precision artifact out in the field not in the lab was kind of an issue and so NIST working in uh, concert with uh, Brunson who uh, is a company that makes uh, a lot of test and measurement artifacts uh, you know targets and, and uh, uh, measurement artifacts and so forth um, Worked with, those two worked together to come up with a uh, reliable, yeah. calibrated, NIST traceable yeah. uh, artifact for use with laser trackers out in the field. So for, for people in the 3D measurement uh, world, it's kind of a big deal, particularly if you, if you either manufacture laser trackers or if you use laser trackers, there is now a NIST traceable, or will be, I, I'm not sure if it's on the market yet, but there is a list, uh, NIST traceable yeah. uh, artifact for va verifying your, your laser tracker yeah. uh, on the field. It's, it's, it's kind of a big deal, and this has been working on it for yeah. quite a while, and, and Brenson obviously is a, is, a, is a big hitter in this field, so the two together have come up with a, quite an interesting uh, little device. Yeah. Okay, well as Mike said, it's time now for CMSC Corner, Peak, speaking of large volume yeah. 3D measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, once a month, we bring a guest from the Coordinate Metrology Society to talk about metrology, metrology chaining, and so forth. The Coordinate Metrology Society's conference, the CMSC, is the only show of its type in North America for portable 3D measurement hardware, software, and peripherals focused mainly on large volume 3D measurement. Uh, the past summer, the CMSC uh, the CMS and the University of North Carolina at Charlotte were awarded an Advanced Manufacturing Technology Consortia, uh, AMTEC. Uh, it was a grant from AMTEC and the National Student uh, Institute of Standards and Technology. The idea was to form a new industry-led coalition and strengthen existing, uh, uh, existing coalitions and ties to tackle some shared technical barriers and accelerate the growth of advanced manufacturing. Of course, if you have advanced manufacturing and you manufacture something, you also need to measure it. Mm -hmm. And that is where the CS CMSC comes in, particularly with regards to large volume 3D measurement. So today we'll be talking to Ron Hicks about the Precision Path Consortium at CMSC. Hi, Ron. Hello. How are you guys today? Uh, pretty good. Hey, so did I? I'm not sure if I botched that too much. Did I kind of hit on the mission of Precision Path Consortium in in my run up there? Yeah, you were perfect. That, <laughs> that was great. Okay. So so the idea is the the, the idea is that. Uh, to kind of facilitate the 3D measurement aspect of that in, in advanced manufacturing? Well, 3D measurement, of course, is, is really uh, the focus of our uh, consortium, but we're really trying to do our part in terms of uh, uh, improving the manufacturing base in the United States so we can compete globally. And that's, that's really, I think, the brunt of, of the... Uh, whole idea here, so we're, we want to do our part by improving large-scale coordinate metrology to uh, better accommodate uh, manufacturing here in the United States. So Ron, what, what companies are currently members of the Precision Path Consortium? Well, we've got some heavy hitters. Uh, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, uh, let's see who else, Spirit Aerospace, Siemens, um, mm -hmm. Caterpillar, um, 
just to name a few. Uh, and also we have some of the leading metrology companies, uh, for instance, Hexagon Metrology, Ferro, um, Nikon Metrology, and we have some very good service companies uh, on our on our consortia is also uh, ECM Global Measurement Solutions, to name one. But we have, oh, New River Kinematics. Don't let me leave out New River Kinematics. So we already have a very good cross-section of our industry. Um, there's a lot more companies out there, a lot more hardware, software, and end users out there that we have not reached out to yet, but we want to in the near future. Now, you, you recently, I think in, in October, was it, you had your second uh, consortium meeting? I mean, this, this consortium is fairly, is fairly recent, so I think your second meeting was what, uh, October? Yes, it was in October uh, in Chicago, and we had probably 25 to 30 people there and had a very, very good day meeting and talking about, uh, you know, what's, uh, how, how can we improve? What, how, how do we uh, improve the metrology industry to best suit manufacturing? And I, I, I had my ears up that day and I really heard some good things coming from uh, some of these major companies, so it was a great learning experience well, for me. Can, can you give us kind of an idea of, uh, if it's not too early to talk about this, some of the stuff that, that came out of this, and you know, maybe some of the ideas uh, that you guys are looking at going forward? Well, I, I think one of the things, or, or, or some of the things that stuck with me were um, making our equipment and software easier for the shop floor guy to be able to go out and, uh, and use the equipment to their advantage. Uh, better accuracy, and the other thing is uptime, uh, you know, some of the equipment that are in our industry is uh, it, it's kind of finicky at times, and uh, we need to do better. I think everybody needs to do better to where the uh, the equipment is there and it's usable at a high percentage time. You know, 95 to 98 percent of the time, that that equipment needs to be up and, and operating correctly. So those were some of the biggest things uh, that I heard from the first meeting. Now, if if a company's interested in being a member of the consortium, uh, how would they do that? I mean, can anybody join it? I mean, what, what's, what, who, who, who's, is it limited to anybody or can anybody join it? If so, how would they do it? Our, our process originally, uh, we got together and, and uh, basically looked at the CMS's role of member companies and reached out to a cross section of those. Many uh, were interested, some were not. And we've had a lot of people interested since we've gotten started and started uh, publicizing where, where we're, what we've been doing. Uh, right now, we probably will not be able to take everybody that would like to participate at this time, but please contact me. And uh, we will be probably taking members on selectively, but as we move into uh, the next several months, we'll be having uh, the ability to um, meet with a large number of companies and, and hear what they have to say as well. So right now we're really trying to fit this into about a 30 person consortium right now that's uh, really can, where we can focus. Then we're going to expand. So the uh, folks at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte have been very good in terms of being able to guide us through this path and uh, I'm really excited about the work we're going to be able to uh, to get accomplished over the next few months. Well, speaking of that, Ron, uh, and just to wrap this up, uh, so what is the, the future? What's the, in the immediate future? What's, what's on the agenda uh, for this project in the next uh, few months? Well, we, of course, we had our meeting in October. We put together a report that's basically an internal report now. We're going to meet again in February, uh, and the 24th, 25th time frame in North Carolina at the University of, Char uh, of North Carolina. And um, we're basically going to take it a step further and do a, a needs assessment and gap analysis workshop. And from that, we hope to get a better or clearer understanding of uh, where we think we need to go, what, what's the pain levels at the various companies, and be able to hear what the end users, uh, the Boeings and the Siemens and those folks, what they really need from uh, the metrology industry, and, and let's try to have an open 
quorum to ensure that uh, we're really communicating very well and the metrology industry is satisfying these companies. So I, I look for a, a formal report to come out after this meeting as to where we're at. We're also rolling out a website and all everything that we're going to uh, do and uh, uh, as a result of the uh, meetings will be loaded on our website. I don't have the uh, URL for that quite yet, but but I'll get that for you. And uh, we're very excited to be able to uh, share that information with the uh, with the industry. And Ron, well, uh, uh, in the meantime, if they if people want more information on this, should they go to the the CMSC website or 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 how? Uh, right now, uh, until our website's up and running, I would say just contact me. Okay. Uh, you can, you're welcome to call or email me, and I'll be happy to give you whatever information you need. Uh, we'll include, uh, I'll be sure to include your contact information then. Mm. Uh, on the player screen. On, on, the players, on the player screen. I don't think it's there right now, but uh, uh, I'll use your, just your, uh, your API um, email address. Yeah, that, that will be fine. Okay. All right. Well, Ron Hicks, uh, uh, Precision Path uh, Consortium Chairperson, mm -hmm. uh, thanks for joining us uh, this morning. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Okay. You too, Thanks, Ron. Have a good weekend. Thank All you. Right. All right. Bye -bye. All right. Well, that's our show. But before we close, I'd like to offer thanks to this week's sponsor, uh, Olympus. Uh, discover another dimension in microimaging and metrology with test, measurement, inspection, and imaging instruments designed for high precision quality control and R&D. Olympus engineered solutions enhance quality and productivity in industrial markets around the world. For more information, click on the banner ad just below or just to the right of this video player screen. That's right. Okay, well, thank you once again for joining us on uh, Quality Digest Live. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you may have noticed, maybe not, uh, we're actually streaming in uh, HD now. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're using our new player, if HD is too fast for you, you actually have your choice of selecting the speed that works best for you down in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. So just keep looking for that in um, upcoming QDLs. That's right. So. So you guys all have a great weekend. We'll, we'll see you next week with a full week of QDD and QDL back here on Friday. So yeah. have a great weekend and we'll see you then. So long. Bye.